Hey there, welcome to Perspective on Athletics. I'm Mark Majeski. I really appreciate you joining us again today. We've got a great interview lined up with Randy Siminski. He is the athletic director at SUNY Canton, and SUNY Canton is right in the middle of the NCAA Division III membership process. Randy's gonna share with us what went into the process for SUNY Canton in deciding to transition from NAIA to Division III? Who was involved, what those conversations were like, and then what it's been like to actually go through the application process and now participate in the provisional membership process. So sit back, enjoy this conversation with Randy Siminski of SUNY Canton, and as always, please comment on these and comment on Perspective on Athletics. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you'd like to see. We want to keep broadening and deepening our pool of interviews and provide valuable content for those that are out there listening. Take care. Randy, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you taking time. Always great to talk to you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you, and it looks like the weather in New York is as beautiful as ever. You know what? If I opened the window, you'd see a little bit of snow on the ground this morning. So it's the first one that's really stuck. It seems early this year, but it's chilly. Yeah, well, hey, that's the product of where you are, which is what, about 10 or 20 miles from the Canadian border? Yeah, we're only less than 20, actually. Yeah, so we're pretty close. Yeah, great. Well, again, thanks for taking time. And, and what we're going to be talking about today, we want to learn a little bit more about the NCAA Division Three process and transitioning through that process as an institution and an athletics program. But before we get into that, let's find out just a little bit more about you, a brief snapshot of your background and, and where you came from and how you got to your current position at SUNY Canton. Sure. I've worked most of my professional life in sports. Uh, I started off as a broadcaster and uh, was broadcasting college and high school sports at a local radio station and then uh, decided to give it a whirl in professional hockey and, and I worked in the East Coast Hockey League, the American Hockey League and eventually the National Hockey League. So I worked in uh, minor league hockey for five years and then finally got a break and uh, got a job in the National Hockey League with the Florida Panthers. And I worked for the Panthers for five years as their Vice President of Communications absolutely great experience. But my wife and I are from the Canton Poste area in upstate New York. And once we had a couple of children, we decided to come back to the area. This is home for us, uh, where our families are from, and, and we have so many friends. So we decided to come back to the area, and that's how I got involved with athletics here at SUNY Canton. Right. And I know that when you first were there, or at least at some point, you're also doing double duty in the Office of Communications, if I remember correctly, what, and trying to be an athletic director. How, what was that like? Busy, <laughs> very busy. But as you know, it's almost uh, similar to when I worked in minor league sports. You wear a lot of different hats. And right. We're a smaller institution. We've got about 3,200 full-time students and maybe 3,800 uh, in enrollment altogether with full-time and part-time. But so sometimes you wear a few different hats. But I was the director of public relations here for seven years, okay. and then for the last couple overlapped and did both jobs, uh, both director of public relations and uh, director of athletics. But as I think most of the people watching this video can attest to that uh, Director of Athletics is full-time enough. It's more than full-time. So uh, once we started adding sports and growing as an institution, we realized that uh, I need to focus on athletics exclusively, and that's where I am. Yeah. Well, uh, and in fact, that's probably a very important call that you're going to ignore right now, I'm sure. <laughs> right. But so that's perfect because you've been at the institution a while. So I'm sure that you were a part of those original discussions about athletics and, and where to move. And I believe you were an NAIA member at the time. But can you take us back? So on a campus, you've got an athletic program and things are going well or, or however they're going. But how did these discussions even come up? And, and what were some of those early conversations about? Out related to moving to the NCAA and maybe specifically Division III? You know, I think our athletic department really reflects the growth of our college. And for about 90 years, we were a two-year school. We offered just associate degrees, but then we started offering four-year degrees and eventually continued to do that. Our first year, our first uh, four-year offering was in 1998, but we continued to uh, grow and offer more and more. And once we got enough of those four-year degrees, we started thinking about for your athletics to allow our students who are coming to our school and staying for four years the opportunity to participate for four years. So we went from the National Junior Collegiate Athletic Association, the NJCAA, to the NAIA. We were in the Sunrise Conference in the NAIA for a few years and then we realized that um, the NCAA was going to be a better home for us, particularly in the Northeast when 
-hmm. almost everybody's NCAA. Right. And uh, we have three neighbors within 10 miles, all NCAA Division okay. three schools in St. Lawrence, Clarkson, and SUNY Potsdam. Mm -hmm. Most of New York is all NCAA schools for the four-year uh, schools. Mm -hmm. So it just made sense for us. The NAI was really good for us in our in our growth from in, from two year to four year athletics. But the NCAA, when you talk about uh, four year athletics mm -hmm. in the Northeast, the NCAA is the way to go. The, the argument could be made nationwide, but certainly in the Northeast and in in our region, mm -hmm. that's the way to go. So it's been a natural progression. For us. And, and so when those thoughts started taking place and those conversations were taking place where did where did those initiate were, were they coming from the athletic department and coaches saying hey it's time for us to look for something new was it an institutional decision looking at some of your neighbors that you mentioned to say where are we best going to fit athletically or who was all involved in those types of discussions you know i would say it was uh the the executive cabinet of our college but i also think and and they uh, they also realized that it made sense for us. Mm -hmm. And as we were progressing in the NAIA, the Sunrise Conference, uh, pretty much everybody in the Sunrise Conference realized that they, they were uh, headed out of the NAIA with the exception of two schools that very same year. So our conference kind of ended just about the same time we said, you know, we need to make that uh, switch. So, uh, but it was something that we really recognized early on that uh, ultimately down the road that I think the NCAA made the most sense for us. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a culmination of everyone just coming together and say, you know, it's time. This is what we need to do. This is uh, who, we're, who we're becoming. Uh, we also had to grow the number of sports that we were offering. Uh, when I took over three years ago, we had nine sports and 126 athletes. Now we have 14 sports and nearly 300 athletes. So we've grown significantly in just yeah. three years, yeah. adding five sports. Um, but you know, I think we, we did it in the right way. We grew in the right way. We had a couple of club teams. We had a, a club lacrosse team. We had a club uh, hockey team that those were easy uh, transformations from club to varsity. It's almost a natural progression there as well. And then some other sports that were quick additions for us, men's golf. Right. Uh, there's a lot of guys on campus that like to golf, uh, you know, almost no, no matter where you are, even when we have snow outside uh, in an area like, like Canton, New York. But um, so that volleyball uh, we added uh, quickly. And, and so um, I think it was a natural progression for us in a lot of different ways. We were ready yeah. to do that. Now, were you in a situation where you were offering any kind of athletic aid previously, either at the JC level or when you were a part of the NAIA? The NAIA would allow you to offer scholarships, and we actually did that with two students, uh, one male hockey player, one uh, softball pitcher, and that was about it. Um, so that made it easier for us, too, as we switched over to the NCAA and could no longer offer that. Um, those students have since aged out. You know, they, bo they both graduated uh, right. last year. Right. Um, so... Yeah, the, the, the reason I bring it up is that sometimes as people are thinking about this and, and the discussion gets down to the coaching level, if it's an institution that's offering athletic aid, scholarships, and even you know partial scholarships, their fear, anytime you start talking about Division Three, which is a non-scholarship uh, division, that how are they going to be able to recruit and, oh, it's going to impact their program in a negative way. How, what was the reaction when it got down to discussions with the coaches on your campus when you were talking about this potential transition? Be, to be quite honest, because we offered so few, it wasn't really a big factor for us. Uh, so that, that made it easy. But I think for schools that are looking to transition, they need to decide, okay, should we, would we be a better fit in Division II or Division III? Um, and you know, what is your philosophy? What is, how do you recruit? And um, are, are you going to need to give scholarships in order to recruit those student athletes or not? And we feel pretty strongly, uh, felt at the time pretty strongly that we wouldn't have to because we already weren't. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was just a continuation of the vast majority of our students not getting scholarships. And, and, and that's the way it is now. And our rosters have continued to grow. I, I certainly believe that the uh, NCAA brand has helped us to recruit as, uh, and to enable us to uh, expand our boundaries and our recruiting areas. Um, so that is, that has helped, uh, having that NCAA brand. Yeah. Um, it, as I said, in the Northeast, if you say NAI, a lot of people don't know uh, what the NAI is. So certainly the NCAA brand has helped us along with our new athletic facility. That's certainly helped a lot. 
Right. So it's, it's been an interesting process, and I think a lot of those discussions uh, have to take place. And it sounds like you are very thorough in your discussions and clear about the reasons for making such a move. Too often, uh, I think people don't spend the time to think about what they may be getting into, and it can cause problems later on. But when you made the decision or the decision was made that, okay, SUNY Canton was going to be a good fit for Division Three, and we're going to make this happen, did your president uh, or chancellor there understand what was going to be happening? Because also sometimes senior administrators think, oh, well, we just need to fill out a paper application, put our signature on it, and now we're members. Can you talk a little bit about uh, just the getting ready to make sure everybody understood how big of a transition this could be for the institution. Yeah, I think our president knew. You know, I, he was uh, uh, pretty involved, okay. and uh, this wasn't the only school that he had, uh, he had been with. He had been with an NCAA school before, so I think he recognized that it's not just about <clears throat> athletics going to the NCAA. It's about the entire school, and we talk about financial aid and admissions and so many other areas that athletics affects. It's a buy-in from everybody on campus, the registrar's office, the provost's office, that sort of thing. That uh, It's not just athletics deciding to uh, change conferences sort of thing. So it's a much larger commitment to that. And I, and I think that that was very important for us. And certainly your visit to campus helped us recognize that as well. When we went and met with every single office uh, that would be affected by this and uh, talked with them about how it would affect them and, and in different ways and um, things that we should be looking out for now that we weren't before or um, how things were going to change and involving everybody more with the entire process of when we're recruiting an athlete to when they apply to when they're uh, when they get financial aid and then when they enroll and all of those processes as well when they and when they're here we keep them and make sure they're full time and maintain that uh, status that sort of thing so um, there was a lot there but it's again, it's breaking it down piece piece by piece and, and approaching it in an office by office and then a grander scheme as well. well. And it does just listening to you, and I know about the process, but just listening to you, it sounds like it could be overwhelming for an institution and an athletic director trying to, to manage all of this. But how was it for you? Or maybe talk a little bit about, okay, the decision's made, and now we're going to do this. And, and what has it been like so far to actually go through contacting the NCAA and, and making the application, and now you're gone through year one and two? What, what has the overall process been like, and, and how have you been able to manage all of this? You know, it's been great, and I really have to credit the folks at the NCAA, uh, Azure Davey, Gene Orr, uh, and everybody else in their offices. They've been terrific. Uh, they've been welcoming. I think a lot of people are intimidated by the NCAA at first, particularly as you as you look at media coverage regarding Division I athletics and um, how the NCAA came down hard in a particular school with uh, um, uh, penalties or things like that. And, uh, it, it hasn't been and was never like that at all. Uh, They've been uh, very welcoming. They've been extremely helpful. So that's, that's helped our process uh, considerably. Um, we call them probably more than, uh, more than they'd like sometimes, but uh, they've always been great. They, they've answered our emails, our phone calls, that sort of thing. The other thing is we've leaned on uh, other athletic directors, other schools, just with quick questions. And it's not just me as the athletic director, but my associate athletic director, assistant athletic director, compliance coordinator. They're making calls to other schools and say, hey, have you gone through this before? And that's been extremely helpful as well. And then if we get a couple of question marks back, then sometimes we call the NCAA and, and ask them. Um, but for the most part, people have been terrific working with us and recognizing um, that uh, we're just we're just starting out we're in those provisional stages and they've been extremely helpful. We've got some good neighbors up here um, with the other three schools in the in the uh, ten mile radius. But then there's been some other schools like SUNY Morrisville and Coble Skill and uh, uh, others Casanova who've been been very helpful uh, to us and recognizing. And some of those schools have gone through the process within the last ten years as well. So yeah. that's been extremely helpful. Well, that's great. It's good to have friends and, and people that can help mentor you through the program. What has been the biggest you know, challenge or the biggest thing that you've had to deal with? I know you've mentioned growing your sports program from 9 to 14. Uh, compliance is a big deal within the world of Division Three, but from a programmatic and staffing and operational standpoint, what are, what are some of the bigger challenges that you think you've had to address making the transition from an NAIA institution to Division Three and meeting expectations and best practices at that level? 
Well, one of the great things when you talk about staffing, we, we have expanded staff. Um, for example, in the athletic trainer's office, we had one athletic trainer before, now we have two athletic trainers and a part-timer. And that's just part of going from 126 athletes in nine sports to almost 300 athletes, 14 sports, and contact sports like men's and women's hockey and uh, men's and women's lacrosse. Those are, those are sports that are going to uh, require more time than some of the other non-contact sports. So certainly our athletic training office has uh, gotten a lot busier than it was a few years ago. But uh, the great thing about it is we really had some terrific support from our president and vice presidents in making this move and, and for them to recognize that it was going to take uh, some additional staff. And we haven't gone crazy or, you know, certainly as crazy as I would have liked in terms of expanding our staff. I mean, who doesn't want more folks? But uh, um, they, they had made that commitment to go to the NCAA. And I think they also recognized that we were going to be bringing in that many more students as well. You talk about men's lacrosse. Uh, you know, we bring in a considerable number of players. Women's lacrosse, a high roster uh, team. Women's hockey, uh, same thing. So you're talking about a lot more students as witnessed by the number of our student athletes over the last few years. So uh, that's gonna benefit the school and enrollment as a whole. But then we also have to, at some point, reinvest in those student athletes to make sure that their experience is appropriate. So uh, I, I say that, but it wasn't really a challenge because of, uh, of the terrific backing from our administration. So we're very fortunate in that regard. I'd say, uh, you know, some of the challenge has to be um, just being, uh, uh, feeling like you're ready to make, take all these appropriate steps and, and, uh, uh, not, not allow yourself to get intimidated by, um, just the amount of work it is for this, this type of transition. Yeah. The NCAA is great about helping through and the more you reach out, the more that others, uh, are, are helpful to making that transition. So no, there's a lot of paperwork. You know, uh, particularly the year-end reports and the provisional uh, reports and things like that. Uh, but in doing those, they're extremely helpful in reflecting, okay, what kind of year did we have? Where do we need more work? Where did we do well? And then you, uh, as you progress through that, you keep those things in mind. So that's been helpful for us. It's also been helpful for us to take a look at almost every aspect of what we do and how we do it, from the student handbook to um, uh, recruiting to all of those other things that uh, involve every aspect of athletic administration and what we do with our student athletes, uh, it's it's been very healthy for us you know, to take that in depth of a look. Time consuming but healthy. So it's uh, you know it's wiped out our summers uh, because that's really when it's a great time to get things done in June, July, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's been very good for our program. Yeah, well, it's, you know, I think that's a great answer, and, and it's you're fortunate that you do have that type of support. I know some people are going to be curious about this, and, and you made the move from 9 to 14 teams, but if you were to ballpark this, you know, just off the top of your head, going back before you, you know, started this transition, do you have a percentage that your budget had to increase to accommodate the things that you did or, or a number? Just people, you know, that's one of the biggest questions and, uh, and hesitancies I think people have is can we afford to do this and and it just helps people put some context to your type of situation yeah i'm trying to think of the uh the, the five sports that we added um three of those had full-time coaches and two were part-time coaches so uh men's golf and women's lacrosse are both part-time coaches uh men's lacrosse is part-time coach actually so i guess it's three out of the five were part-time coaches uh, women's hockey and volleyball were both full-time coaches. So two out of the five sports we added were full-time coaches. Uh, quite honestly, I'd love to make a couple more coaches full-time. Uh, and, you know, I guess that's a college by college, program by program, um, uh, as you look at it. And, you know, it's tough when you've got a part-time coach competing against full-time coaches in the same playing field and the full-time coaches, that's where all of their energies go toward and recruiting and things like that. But, uh, that varies, obviously, in Division Three, and that's part of what makes Division Three special. And and uh, you just have to uh, adapt and try to grow as much as possible, and um, hope that you can recruit and be as competitive as possible. 
you know, one of the things that you mentioned early on was part of the discussion and decision-making process revolved around the brand of the NCAA. And, and I think that is a, a big reason why a lot of people explore this at whatever level they choose to affiliate with. But so now that you're in this, you're in this provisional process where for three or probably four years, you're not eligible for certain things and you're not eligible for postseason competition. And that is another stumbling point for a lot of people. I think they look at this period of time where if they leave the NAIA, they, they are done. The NAIA doesn't let you, let you continue with their championship and you've got to kind of wait this period out. So I'm curious about that impact and how that you, you and the coaches have dealt with that, but then also the upsides of the brand affinity that, that you mentioned early on. Yeah, because not only is it great to uh, bring the NCAA brand for us, but it really does help to change our college brand. But in regards to your question about playoffs, um, we've been very fortunate. We joined the USCAA. The United Small College Athletic Association. That's been wonderful. They've got almost a hundred schools and so that's been outstanding for a lot of our sports and we've also joined the ECAC. They've been terrific as well. So if you look at uh, a lot of our sports, uh, men's and women's soccer, men's and women's basketball, volleyball, a number of our sports, golf, men's and women's cross country, they all have uh, postseason opportunities either through the USCAA or potentially the ECAC. So quite honestly, the teams for us that have been postseason worthy have, have had postseason opportunities, uh, and that's been terrific. So, for example, last year our men's soccer team was our first team in college history to uh, make it to the ECACs. We received a berth in the upstate regional uh, ECAC playoffs. That was fantastic, great experience. Our men's lacrosse did as well. In terms of USCAA competition, uh, men's golf has gone the past couple of years. Our cross country team has gone the past three years. Um, so we've had postseason opportunities for teams, which has been great. And uh, so that allows our teams, when they start the season, to know that there's something on the line every game. Uh, and if they're good enough, they should be able to uh, get a postseason berth. So that has been terrific for us in that in that space between NAIA and the NCAA. So both of those organizations have, uh, have really treated us well and allowed us to get some postseason births. Men's Lacrosse got an ECAC birth last spring as well, first time for that in, uh, pro in, our, in our program history. So that's been terrific, yeah. uh, enabling us to do that. In terms of a brand, um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the evolution of the school, the NCAA brand, I think it certainly helped us with that. We were battling when we first started offering bachelor's degrees, we were battling about 90 years of a two-year school, associate degree uh, school. And as we've evolved, we've knocked down those barriers and people began to recognize us as a four-year school. And certainly um, the NCAA reinforces that, that we're no longer a two-year school, that we're a four-year school, that we offer a wide variety of bachelor's degrees. And um, so that has been terrific. Uh, as from a branding perspective on our entire school, not just athletics. Yeah, well, that's great. I appreciate those comments because I know a lot of people are curious about both sides of that, that coin. So lastly, as we wrap up this segment uh, and, and move on to a couple other quick uh, things we're going to finish with, if somebody is considering this, and they might be a school in the Northeast or Southwest or wherever they might be, you're in the middle of it. You've gone through the planning and execution of the initial phases. What, what would you say to an institution, whether it's the AD or a, a president or anybody else involved, what, what advice do you have for these schools that are thinking that maybe this is what they want to do, but they're not sure? What do you think they need to do and think about? I think one of the most important things is do you have the minimum number of sports or will you? And will you be able to fill those rosters? Because those are two of the big things that uh, the NCAA will look at. And without those minimal uh, things, uh, you'd, be in, you'd be in tough shape. So those are two big things. How many sports do you offer? And uh, are you filling your rosters out with the appropriate number? And you know, are you in a situation where you're worried about that on a daily basis or not? So uh, you know, those are a couple of, couple of the big things. Uh, beyond that, I guess I would say, who are your neighbors? You know, what are the other schools around you? NCAA, is it going to uh, uh, benefit you to become part of the NCAA with them? For us, when we were in the NAI, we were traveling 
long distances to fill out our schedule, with, particularly with the Sunrise Conference. We were a 15-hour bus ride to uh, uh, University of Maine in Presque Isle and University of Maine, Fort Kent, great schools, but a long ways away. So we're hoping to, uh, one of the things that uh, helps us with the NCAA is a lot less travel because so many schools are closer to us. But then you also, if you look at your brand and when you look at athletics, what, what, what are some of the biggest things that athletics do for a college beyond just having games and having them be fun and, and you might be a sports person and that's the way to go. But beyond that, uh, I think you have to take a look at the image of the school and enrollment. And so certainly from an enrollment perspective, we've increased our enrollment from a student athlete um, perspective considerably. But then the image of the school. Now when we go play somebody in, say, central New York or uh, an hour away or 10 miles away, when that's reported in the newspaper or when the high school students in that area go to watch that game, SUNY Canton may be a consideration for them because we're who are we associating with? You know, who's our new friends now? Uh, who are we playing? Who are we hanging out with sort of thing? And it's those other schools. And I think that's a big consideration. So it changes. That helps change our brand, change who we associate with. But also when the... Uh, the newspaper in Utica or Syracuse or Albany or Plattsburgh reports a score, SUNY Canton is there and it's a consideration for prospective student athletes or just a consideration uh, to be seen and from, from an image standpoint, whereas when it was in Northern Maine and, and newspaper, I don't know if that did us a lot of good. Yeah, it's kind of like where are all the cool kids hanging out, and you know sure. that's that's where you want to be. And I think that is a serious issue that a lot of schools are struggling with. Sometimes they want to increase their brand equity, and in some cases, brand recognition. You know, let alone sure. equity. And I think that's a big reason why the NCAA has so much appeal. But too many of them are focused simply on that aspect and not going about it with all the proper steps, like you guys did, to really prepare yourself and, and understand what it can do across the board for the institution. So absolutely. Pre appreciate those thoughts on the whole process. And and before we uh, wrap up, there's a couple things I want to ask you about that I always ask our guests about. And one thing is related to leadership in athletics today. As you mentioned, there are so many bad things happening out there that are reported upon in the newspapers that uh, college athletics is tarnished in many ways, but there are a lot of people doing things right, but it comes down to leadership. And so I'm curious your thoughts about leadership as it relates to athletics today, what you feel is important and what do you think needs to happen, but what about leadership in, in ath athletics today? Well, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that we have some great leaders uh, on our athletic staff and also uh, at the college. So uh, I'm very fortunate in that regard. And I think the important part is that everybody works together, um, not only from um, uh, a team standpoint, but coaches working together and uh, coaches working with administrators uh, and getting involved on campus. That's been one of our big emphasis, emphasis, points of emphasis this year is involving ourselves more on campus, getting out a little bit more. Uh, we've asked uh, professors to serve as faculty athletic liaisons for each sport. So we don't just have a faculty athletic rep, we have a professor that works with every sport. I know a lot of colleges do that as well, but uh, it's been a point of emphasis for us to support other areas on campus. So we're, it's just not us asking people to come and support us at our games. You know, that would be a selfish perspective, but you have to show other people that you care about what they're doing for them to care about what you're doing. So that's been, uh, that's been something that we've been trying to grow over the last couple of years, and I, particularly this year, and I think we continue to do that and emphasize that. And that's been really helpful for us. And I also think that um, that caring should exist between teams. So we have particular games that we ask all of our student athletes to come to. We do one per season. So we have one men's soccer game. That we ask all of our students, student athletes to come to one for women's soccer, one for men's basketball, that sort of thing. So and we've let that develop through our SAC program. Um, so we try to build that camaraderie, not just on our teams, but with our student athletes and, and um, grow some of those common goal type of um, uh, goals, uh, if, if lack of a better word. But uh, so we try to grow that in caring and working more and more together. And we've done that too with our philanthropic events. We brought in Special Olympics, which we held last spring for the first time on campus. That was spectacular. We had uh, more than 200 volunteers and more than 200 athletes. It was probably the best day for us all year long on our campus. Wow. And uh, so that's been really something terrific, and you know, that's something that obviously the NCAA 
um, uh, worked so hard uh, with Special Olympics, and, and, and we decided to jump on board. And uh, for that reason alone, it, it may be worth jumping the NCAA because it has been. <laughs> that was just uh, probably a, uh, as an athletic director, probably the most proud day that I've ever had here at SUNY Can because it was an awesome event. Everybody had so much fun. And I originally thought that we were kind of uh, doing this event for the Special Olympians. And then I realized, you know, <laughs> selfishly, uh, we've been, I think we benefited more than they did. They came and had fun, but we, uh, we just had a day that we won't forget. Yeah. You know, so it was a terrific day. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of great examples of, the, of that type of thing happening, and, and you're right. It, though it all comes back to leadership. It has to be somebody in, in a group of people committed to doing the right thing and working together. So I appreciate your thoughts on that. And lastly, I, I think there is an ever-increasing market of up-and-coming administrators to be a lot of graduate programs and undergraduate programs and sports administration athletic administration and the bottom line is there just aren't that many jobs out there there the the demand is probably higher than the actual job uh, opportunities that are out there but if you are talking to a young up-and-coming administrator to be what sorts of things do you think are important for he or she to, to think about and what advice would you give them well, it's a great question, and I, I do speak um, at some local high schools as well as uh, not only some classes at SUNY Canton because we have a sports management major, but some classes at some other uh, local colleges as well. And uh, a lot of them will ask me about uh, my experience in the National Hockey League and how did I get there. I grew up on a farm, so it wasn't like I had a lot of contacts in the NHL, um, <laughs> nor did I play hockey. Even. Um, but the funny thing with my experience in the NHL, and I relate that here at SUNY Canton as well, is that when I worked uh, for the Florida Panthers, we would have uh, anywhere from five to six interns every year. And inevitably, some of them were so good that we ended up hiring them. Not necessarily in the PR department, but particularly if somebody was great. They proved that they were uh, really good at their job. They came in every day, didn't miss a day, worked hard. You could depend on them. They were intelligent, that sort of thing. Person who got along with everybody else, you didn't want to let them go, they ended up getting a job. So here I was, uh, 35, 40 years old, going, I busted my tail for 10 years trying to get in the NHL, and this, this kid's coming out of college at 21, and we just <laughs> offered him a job. It was killing me. And I was proud of those, uh, those students. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But the point is internship, internship, internship. If, you're, if, you're really, if you really want to work in athletics, the first job you have to get is probably one that you're doing for free, yeah. and that's a, with an internship. Uh, but that gets you the contacts you need, it gets you the experience you need, it gives you the opportunity to show people in the business that you can do the job, that you can be dependable, that you're intelligent enough, that you're personable enough, that sort of thing. And I can't emphasize it enough. And then even now when we hire, uh, whether it's a coach or a sports information director or anybody, um, you need references. And we want references for people in the business that say they can jump right in, they know what they're doing, they've been there before, and uh, they can do it well. So I can't emphasize enough to current students that an internship is the way to go and to try to get that internship with where you want to work. So if you want to work in Division Three athletics, try to get an internship with a Division Three school. If you want to work in D1, try to do it there. If you want to work in pro sports, try to get a pro sports internship. That way you start almost where you want to be as opposed to working your way up the chain, which can be a lot more difficult. Yeah, right. Great advice, and I know that uh, up-and-comers are going to appreciate hearing those say, those words that you just shared. I think yours is a great story, but yeah, the, the story about hiring interns and then per turning those people into full-time positions within the organization is great. Great advice, Randy. Sure appreciate your time. We do need to wrap up here, and I wanted to say thank you once again for sharing your insights and perspective on what it's been like to work through the NCAA Division Three membership process. You guys still have a little bit uh, to go, but I know that you're going to do a great job and finish strong and, and become a full active member here. That person's calling for a second time, so I know it must be very, very important. So I'm just hoping it's not the college president. <laughs> that, that's right. Randy, again, thank you very much. We appreciate your time for joining us uh, here on Perspective on Athletics. All right. Thanks, Mark. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Take care.